We forget sometimes, I do, I certainly do, um, what it's like for players to be traded. I was talking to my daughter last night and explaining it to her. I said, you know, picture you came home from school today and somebody called you and said you're moving to Philadelphia. You know, get on a plane tomorrow. So there's a, there's a hu human side to this stuff where the counter argument to that is, you know, this is a business. Well, you guys are in business and I'm in business and nobody's making us do that. So um, when you do that many players, when you trade that many guys, it kind of hits you. Um, it's not, it's obviously much harder for them, but you have a realization of, wow, this is, this is big for guys that have kids, um, you know, have families. And, and uh, so to D'Angelo and to Glenn and Alec and uh, Amari and Jacob, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. And they, they were all professional, spoke to all of them since, since we moved them. Um, and they all handled it gracefully and professionally, same as they did when they were here. So we appreciate, um, on the behalf of the organization, appreciate all that they all brought and wish them well. And, uh, you know, to a man, they all were very classy on the phone. It's not always the case when you trade a guy. But they all, uh, you know, were very mature and thoughtful and appreciative. And so uh, I wanted to say that first, to thank them for for what they did for us while they were here, whether they were here. I think most of Jacob was probably the one that was here the longest. So they weren't here that long, but they were great while they were. So any, yeah, that's just what I wanted to say about those guys. Bob, Steve just said earlier that um, that this trade where D'Angelo and Andrew just came down to fit. And you guys were talking, to, you guys have talked all season about how D'Angelo, you guys wanted to at least see if he can go here long term. When did you realize that the fit just wasn't here for him? And, um, well, it's not, it's not, I don't know that it was, that the fit wasn't. We just, you know, looking forward a little bit and, and roster construction and seeing, uh, guessing, we're all guessing when we make any decision, uh, that, you know, the need for a small forward was, was pretty glaring for us. And then looking at the draft and free agency, um, realizing it might have been difficult to fill that need. And so that was some of the thing behind it. But if, but as far as that specific decision, there's there's a positional component of it. There's getting out of the tax component of it. Um, so there's taken in totality. It was kind of the right decision at the right time. But when we are in the room figuring this stuff out or trying to, there's a lot of moving parts and and thoughts like that. And it's just such a fast moving league. When we when we did, I know I was on record when we traded for him that we weren't trade. I mean, when we when we did that, we weren't immediately trading him. And that was the truth, but it's amazing now how fast, it, to nobody's fault, um, how fast things move in the NBA. I was walking over here thinking last year we had the best record in the NBA. Now we have the worst in, in 24 months. And our roster is lost Durant, lost it all. It's just crazy. And so I think with the shorter contracts, with player movement, things are happening um, much faster. I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's kind of the reality of it, uh, of the league. You you mentioned a little in that answer, but how much of a priority was duck in the tax, and when did that become such a larger priority for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because fortunately for me, I work for an ownership group that's spent maybe as much or more as anybody in the last four or five years. Um, you know, a lot of owners – have kind of mandates, you're not going in the tax, we're not going to be a repeater. Um, I mean, my Joe is so competitive, he just doesn't think that way. But at the same time, to be where we are and be in the tax didn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, obviously we're not heading towards the playoffs. And the decision was both financial. I mean, look, we, people, we talk about willingness to spend, but there is a financial implication to every business, and this, this is a business too, and it, it looking forward to see the ramifications of being a repeater at the level we would have been, the numbers got pretty high. Um, you can probably run them yourself and see that if we had drafted in the top you know, five, which we might, those are, that's a salary you plug in. You talk about the TPMLE and you talk about our traded player exception and all of a sudden you're talking about high twos. That's, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a big number for anybody to digest. So as we looked at it, we thought as painful as it was to move some of these guys and do that, um, the thinking was going into 2020 summer, it provided some flexibility and maneuverability w with our payroll. And that was the thought behind it. Um, and we're still going to spend a lot. I mean, I still foresee some good spending ahead of us. 
But there are degrees where you have to be responsible and just say, listen, let's, if we can do this, it's, it's going to be a short-term pain, but maybe an ability to provide more optionality going forward. Was there a sense of urgency to do this trade, D'Angelo Russell, to the Timberwolves now at the deadline as opposed to waiting over the summer, and if so, why? Uh, no, there wasn't a sense of urgency. We didn't, obviously, nobody has to do anything. Um, I think we thought that, you know, having some, we've lost a little bit of continuity. So maybe bringing in a guy, and, and Steph hopefully will be back here, um, seeing how that unfolds and having a chance. And, and, and we thought, like, we, like Steve said and I just said, it's, positionally it was more of a, Ahead, as we said, you know these are the these are the small forward free agents. These are our ways to possibly get one of them, um, and things like I like I referenced are happening so fast now. When you have an opportunity, you have to make a decision, and you can forego it. And we've done that in the past, and it's worked. And maybe you all don't know, but there's there's a ton of things that are presented to you that you have to decide to do or not. And ultimately, we did decide to do this. But sure, there's probably many of you or people that say, you know, you could have done this or that, and that's our job to make those decisions and and you probably know if you're right or wrong a year or two in the future um, even me you know people talk about you draft a player you sign a player and we there's an immediate grade to it or immediate um, reaction but you really don't know um, until one or two or three years out you know when we drafted Draymond people said oh, that's great but after his rookie year he wasn't he wasn't what he is now so you have to sometimes be patient um, and see, and then if you make a mistake, you look back and say, well, why did we make that mistake? Um, so you learn from that. And, and uh, in this case, we just thought it was the right time to do it. Bob, following up on that, obviously you could have you could have waited and you could have seen how he played more with Steph and wait to see where that pick falls down uh, in a few months. Is it fair to say organizationally, though, that you guys thought this was the best move you could get in the moment? the best return you could get in Yeah, for us, I mean, you know, it's all a question of how maybe you value the value of what we got back, and that's that's a personal um, opinion for everybody to make on their own. Um, and then there's the value of the pick. There's the value of getting out of the tax, what we might have had to do otherwise to get out of the tax. So it's all kind of a factor in the whole thing. Um, but the bottom line is, I think, we we think we got a good young player that's 24 years old. And that, I, I mean, if uh, if I recall back when all of our players that are our core were 24, none of them were a finished product. Um, you know, now, nowadays we, whether it's good or bad, we anoint players when they're 20 years old. It's great or awful or 20. It's way too soon to say anything about anybody. I mean, we can probably talk about who Steph Curry is and Clay Thompson and Draymond Green when you're 30 years old. But that goes for any young player, not, not just the one, uh, Wiggins, who we acquired. It's such a, um, we have such opinions of uh, people um, and, and oftentimes I think it's it's hard not to though it's hard not to kind of weigh in especially in the media you have to be have an opinion not, not be in the middle um, but I'm, I'm excited to see how we fit I'm excited to see how we move forward with this group but it is hard because not having clay we won't really get to see the picture of this um, at least not in the near term and so that's that's us having to be patient because I think one of the best things we did in the last six, seven years was figure out a roster that fit. I mean, Kevin was obviously a luxury and, and, and uh, you know, that's a kind of maybe a once, once in 50 year thing where you get a guy like that to get on your team. But even prior to that, we thought, you know, maybe if you put Steph off the ball and put Livingston with him or you put Iguodala with him or maybe you, you get a big guard that can guard some point guards, maybe if you get a playmaking four or five and that's the fun part of the job. But you really don't know until you kind of piece it all together. And the hard part for us, we have to be patient to see how it will fit together. Bob, you know, you talked about how young Wiggins is. D'Angelo's younger. Uh, six months after you get him, you're moving on to another player. Uh, can you confidently say that you gave him enough run with this team to, to, to know what the fit was and that you won't be back in here in six months or in a year and say, well, Wiggins was pretty good, but we're moving on to another player? Um, I mean, today, no, I don't think we will be. But, um, you know, I think the thing with – it's like Steve said, it's it's really the – for us it was looking ahead and saying D'Angelo's – D'Angelo's a very good player uh, and was very good for us from the day one. The first media question he probably got was, are you going to be traded? Um, and he handled that unbelievably well. Um, but I would argue that 
his best position is probably a player we have that plays the same one in, in truth. So sure, we could have said, let's see how this works, and, and it could have worked beautifully. Um, but, but at the same time, for us, we felt like um, having the ability to get a player at a position where we just had a pretty gaping hole, and then now thinking, well, Clay can play two, which is probably, I think, his best position. Steph obviously will play, play the one, and, and now Andrew at the three, and Draymond at the four, and we'll see what happens at the five. Um, we liked the length and the size and athleticism and just thought it was more complimentary. It wasn't an indictment of D'Angelo. It's not, he was great, and he is great, um, but specific to our needs, we just felt like this was a better fit. Um, and I'm sure Minnesota feels the same way. They needed a point guard, and for what they're looking for, it made sense for them. And for what we're looking for, we think it made sense for us. But yeah, you can always speculate as to should you have waited, should you never have done it, should you have waited six months? Should you have waited a year? Should you have waited two years? Um, you can do that all day long with every decision we make. You know, so it's sometimes you just do what you do in the moment, and you live with whatever comes after it. And if it works, great. You get applauded, and if not, you get criticized, and that's that's the job. Um, Bob uh, Andrew Wiggins was obviously a guy who was a go-to option, asked to be a go-to option in Minnesota. What do you see his role? being on this team next season? And um, do you think he's a guy who can benefit from a new environment and just kind of a fresh start? I hope. I hope our environment uh, makes me better, makes players better. I think it is. I We were talking about the difficulty of trading those guys the other night uh, in Brooklyn, and somebody mentioned to me, you know, this is uh, this is really rough on our culture. And I said, you know what's amazing? We have the worst record in the NBA. Um, not one player wanted to go. That's unprecedented. I promise you there's a lot of good players and a lot of good teams that don't want to be there. And so that says something about what Steve has built with his staff, um, what Joe's done, with the, what, what he's provided for the players. But you just don't see that. I promise you as an agent, the trade deadline, I had guys on really good teams saying I don't want to be here, on teams that are in the middle. And I promise you if they were on the worst team in the NBA, they did not want to be there. So I was took a step back and said, wow, we have guys, and some of you might have been in Brooklyn when that went down, and the somberness. I will tell you that most players that are getting traded to a playoff team from a team that is where we are are happy, and they weren't. So that's, I think, a testament to what Steve has built um, and the uniqueness of um, whether it's the leadership of Steph and Draymond and everybody and our coaching staff that you have a place where um, we're losing more than we ever have, yet we're holding on to something that is pretty powerful and hard to build. So the short answer is if you bring somebody into that, you hope that they can become the better version of themselves. I mean, talking to Glenn and Alec, I mean, they were, you know, they felt like this was, for the first time, maybe a place that could be home, and, and they felt like they were appreciated and getting a chance to blossom and and um I think that's a that's the gift that Steve provides from such experience as a player as an eight-time champion um so yeah bringing somebody in if, if our environment can't make somebody better then we're doing something wrong then 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 our environment and our coaching staff and me and all the support we provide isn't worth that much if we don't believe we can improve people You didn't say it at the time. You said that, you know, you didn't get D'Angelo to trade him. But when you got him, were you thinking we might trade him in six months? You know, I wanted to at least, um, I think we all wanted. I mean, we paid him, you know, that question's been asked a lot. I don't, I don't think you pay anybody $120 million with the immediate idea of we don't like him. Um, but you do, like any player, um, have to be open to anything. Um, but the immediate thought wasn't, let's just do this to trade him. Um, he's a good young player, like you said. He's very, very good and very talented. Um, and I think what it came down to was more of, um, as much as people may or may not want to subscribe to it, for us it came down to just the, just the position and just saying, unfortunately, if we, we have this guy um, that's been here that plays this way, and like I said previously, I think the key to building a roster is how do you make each player a better version of themselves? And I referenced like Iguodala and Livingston. I think they 
gave Steph the ability to do some different things. And so then you have to think about um, how do we construct something again um, with the size and length and things like that. But but we, I, to be honest, I wish I wish Steph had not gotten hurt. I wish we did um, get a chance to see more of it. That was the hope. It wasn't just let's do this and, and move on as fast as we can. Bob, two questions for you. One, uh, have you been eyeing Wiggins, and did he just become available now, or was he maybe available for a three-team back when you got D'Angelo? Uh, and secondarily, I was wondering, how did, you clearly had a vision in mind of how Russell would work. What, what was that, that vision? What did you want to see that make you say, okay, this actually does work? Yeah, no, Wiggins wasn't, like I said, we had to start um, – you know they were they were clearly in pursuit of him, so they were they made that known, um, which is part of the way the NBA works, which is fine. Um, so you have to listen. You listen to everything that comes your way, and then you start thinking about it and processing it. But it wasn't until recently that we factoring in everything, saying you know, as the draft approaches with a high pick, can can we find a guy? Forget about a, a small forward, but a one that can help us. And there may be one in the draft. But but these guys are all 19 years old now, or, and, and so you have to say, well, is there one that can help us soon? Or if not, what are we going to do in free agency? So you start having those thoughts. How are you going to replace that position? And then as far as anticipating how it might have worked, um, again, it, it's difficult because I think Clay would have been a huge part of it working. And now, you know, the fact that he's – we don't know if he's coming back, when he's coming back. Um, it would have had – Clay would have been a big part in, in, uh, in the whole thing as he will be going forward. And so it was such an incomplete um, process to, to, to find that answer out. But the vision would have been Steph Clay, D'Angelo, and what that looked like. And it's three 25-point-a-night guys, um, and that's enticing. You know, so that was the, that was the original thought. Um, we'll never know what, what that'll look like. We're going to look at what we have now. And I'm, I'm excited about what's coming our way. And... Um, and it's 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 been a it's I just I do feel bad because I think for from for D'Angelo I I hope now he's in a place where he's just there, you know, I mean that guy's had a, he, he, for what he's been through early in his career he's been most guys it takes ten fifteen years to go through, um, you know number two pick with the Lakers then traded to Brooklyn then to us now it's it's a lot but he's like I said he's gracefully handled it and so um, I talked to him last night on the phone and. High, very mature, appreciative. Um, he was great while he was here. You guys have added quite a few draft picks now over the last couple of weeks, too. Um, how important are those picks going to be, especially having like an un uh, the lightly protected 2021 pick from Minnesota? I mean, do you guys view those as, okay, we want to go into these drafts and get some great young talent, or is it kind of trade assets, or how important are those going to be as supplementing your roster now? I hope, you know, all that. I mean, picks are important. Uh, you know, especially for us, because there's two ways we could have gone. I mean, with Steph Clay and Draymond hitting close to 30, or I don't exactly know their ages, um, the ability to kind of add youth while those guys age, because the biggest fear in our, you know, you got f five or six 33-year-olds or 34, it, it ends, and it ends abruptly. Um, and then it's four, five, six years to get it back. But luckily for us, I guess unlike, <laughs> we're going to have a high pick this year, um, which is unusual. Uh, to have the caliber of players we have and be in this situation. And potentially, I don't know what will happen going forward with, with Minnesota's pick. Um, but I do know first-round picks are highly valuable. You have to draft the right player, but also in, in, as a vehicle to do quite a bit. I mean, they're, they're highly, highly coveted. Maybe never as much as now, the, the value of picks, probably because of the rookie-scale contracts. And it's probably the last way to really construct a roster. When we won championship in 14-15, I think Clay was on a rookie scale, Draymond, Harrison, and, and it might be the last time a team that actually won the championship is under the tax. Um, so it's a way to hopefully build. Uh, I, you know, you'd like to use them for your own because trading them is fine, but you'd like to draft young players. So for our fans, we have a long, long runway. Bob, you guys have been known for uh, going after big names. You tried to get LeBron and Dwight Howard and all that. Is that still a game that you, as a front office, will be part of? Or are you just like, 
we got, we got our stars. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're out of that star chasing game. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I didn't know we tried to get LeBron. Did we try to get? I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I, um, no, no. Um, so, yeah, no. Look, whatever it takes to get better. I mean, sometimes the the, the smaller things become the bigger things. A huge pivotal moment for us was Iguodala, who I, I guess he's a star. He's a superstar. He's, he's I don't think he was thought of like that when we signed him. But that was a huge pivotal moment for us. Um, he was MVP of the finals. So, so that we didn't view that as like, you know, this guy's going to change everything. But those small, Livingston was a huge mid-level signing. Um, so you're trying to piece it together. And some of the teams that are playing really well right now have done a great job. It's not just the stars. Um, they're, they're, they're likely the most important. They get paid the most. But if you look at the teams that end up winning it, like, and we've luckily been there in Toronto last year, the, the, the supplementary or, or other guys, which I think isn't even fair to call them that, the entire team is why you win or lose. Um, there's many, many stars that have never won a championship. And it might not be their fault. Um, it's probably, in many ways, because what was around them didn't quite get them there. But there's some individual brilliant players that have never won a championship, and you can't say it was their fault necessarily. Um, so we'll continue to try to build out. I think we've got some pretty good stars now. Um, but around the edges, it doesn't get enough credit, whether it's our team or any team. The, the, the pieces that hold it together, if I could name players, I'd name 20 of them that I think just are huge difference makers that aren't making $20 million a year. Um, that if, if, you're, if you're looking back on why a team won it, their level of importance is pretty high.